So today, uh, yeah, I, I'm a paleontologist from the University of the Witwatersrand, uh, where I'm a senior lecturer, not yet a professor, but who knows? <laughs> Maybe one day. Um, and uh, as a paleontologist, I will take, the, of course, the, the extinct species approach to the question of whale communication and mostly use that to introduce you to the, the fantastic diversity and weirdness of whales in the past. Uh, and I, I, uh, I will leave, of course, most of the whale communication about modern whales to Lloyd, so to the next talk. I will have to talk a little bit about whale, what whales are doing today to compare to what they did in the past, but I will try not to spoil too much of that. Um, so first, the big question is why would we be so interested about whale communication? What's so important about whale communication? Well, in a very practical way, uh, we live alongside whales and sometimes we interact and sometimes, you know, sometimes they, they don't like us. <laughs> and they communicate about it and they tell each other how to basically sink uh, our boats. So this is a story that has been happening in Portugal for the, the last two years. Orca, one orca, well, one kilo whale, sorry, uh, sunk a boat two years ago, and now they are teaching each other. So they do communicate, and they do communicate, and they do teach other how to how to sink boats. So yeah, we we are interested in whale communication because it has a direct interface with us. Uh, also, whale communication is quite fascinating. <laughs> Because it's sophisticated, it shows some evidence of intelligence uh, for these animals that most animals don't have. So communication, like sophisticated communication happens in humans, of course, and all sorts of primates, in whales, and in elephants. These are the, the three animals in which you have really a social behavior that's that sophisticated. And it's so fascinating that actually, this recording that you're listening now is the recording that uh, astronomers sent to space. You know, they selected on a disc, they selected an amount of s songs and stuff that they wanted the extraterrestrials to hear. Uh, and they, they put that on the Voyager 1 interstellar mission, so it's uh, it's basically a spacecraft that has been sent outside the solar system. And one of the things they selected is a, a whale song. So I, can't, I, I don't pretend I understand why we are so fascinated by whales and their songs, but we are. And we are so fascinated that this is one of the top things we want the extraterrestrials to hear when they find us. <laughs> So whale evolution is a very long story, more than 50 million years. So it almost goes as far back as the, the way when dinosaurs went extinct. So basically everything that lived in the ocean at dinosaur time went extinct. Oceans went, uh, were empty and so the whales came in and they came in from the ground. So that's what that little video is showing you. They were land dwelling animals that basically evolved again back into the water. So this is a 50 million years old story which tells you that every time a whale species goes extinct it's a 15 million years old story that goes extinct. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not just sad, it's a drama, it's really uh, it's really, uh, an awful event. But for my purpose today, uh, I just want to ask the question, yeah, how do you study communication in these extinct animals that look so different from the whales that we know today, because you can see that these land-dwelling ancestors were very different from the whales we know today. And to do that, I will follow the way of sensory organs. We can study sensory organs in extinct animals, and in whales in particular, it's quite easy. <laughs> it's quite easy because their sensory organs are very, they are very, very derived. They are, they are strongly modified by the fact that they live in the water. So, and because they are descended also from a terrestrial ancestor, which implies that their sight, once adapted to sea on land, 
is no longer adapted to sea underwater, so their site is relatively poor, and you can follow that in the fossil record, how their site gets from adapted to live on land to almost, well, to, to very poor site. The, the, they, they lost the sense of smell, or they mostly lost the sense of smell and same thing. You can follow that in the fossil record. They lost their hair, uh, which is the, the main tactile organ in mammals. And uh, they compensated for all of that with hearing. So as they were losing most of their sense organs, or their terrestrial sense organs, they were gaining on another new, well, not particularly new, but enhanced aquatic sense organs, which is mostly the hearing. So you can follow all of these events through the fossil record. So we can start with olfac, uh, sorry, with chemical communication, which includes olfactions and, and taste. So the sense of taste in whales is not particularly developed, and you can see on that dolphin, they, are, they, they have no taste buds, which is weird. It's absolutely, their, their tongue is absolutely smooth. <laughs> and uh, when you look at the brain, they don't have any olfactory bulbs, so the, the part of the brain that's dedicated to smell is undeveloped, uh, except in the largest baleen whales. And they have no Jacobson organ. So the Jacobson organ, uh, you probably don't know it from mammals, but from reptiles, from the snakes. Snakes, they have their forked tongue, and you've probably been told that they smell with their tongue. But they don't actually smell. They, they catch molecules in the air, and they put it back, and uh, how do you call that? Like they will lick their Jacobson organ to put those molecules in their Jacobson organ. So it's a specialized organ for pheromones, particularly. And they don't have that. Whales, unlike snakes, don't have that. Uh, this Jacobson organ, uh, the absence of this Jacobson organ prevents smelling of pheromones. However, recently, uh, scientists discovered that dolphins are intensely swimming into the other dolphins' feces and urine. So they, 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 they see their colleagues peeing and pooping all over the place, and they swim into it. And this, we think, we don't actually know, but we hypothesize, that this is because they are actually trying to smell <coughs> into the those, uh, into those, that, those excrements and excretions. So maybe they have a tiny, tiny leftover of those sense of, of the, that particular smell organ, uh, and this would inform them about particularly uh, who made that pee and that poop. Uh, so who are the who are the the colleagues that were there before? who, uh, what was their health status, and particularly if this is a male looking for a female, what is the reproduction status of that female, for example. And uh, another example, this time not in dolphins, but in baleen whales, another example is how do baleen whales locate the, the fish, like the, the, those, big, those big groups of fish. Uh, they don't use echolocation. We will talk about echolocation and how they use sound to locate uh, their prey. Dolphins do that, but baleen whales don't. So how do they manage to locate those fish? One of the hypotheses, once again, is they smell them. One way or another. It's very difficult to smell underwater, but apparently uh, they, they may be able to smell those big, uh, those big groups of fish. So now we can't really follow when the sense of taste became kind of lost, but the sense of uh, smell, we can follow it through the fossil record. So here you have the brains of a variety of whale ancestors and early whales here. And basically, the, the thing in red at the front of the brain is the olfactory bulbs, and by following the evolution of the olfactory bulbs, we can tell how smell evolved in, in those early ways. And as you can see, the, the olfactory bulbs were quite normal up to this point. You see this kind of a transitional species here, and to this point here, the olfactory bulb becomes very deformed, and we think this is at that point that <laughs> the, 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 the sense of smell 
got kind of lost or at least dramatically altered to a point that it was uh, it was barely usable. And this corresponds to these animals. So quite fascinatingly, you see, this is a whale ancestor. Just a tiny quadrupedal animal that lived somewhere in India, what is nowadays India and Pakistan, 48 million years ago. And this is Remingtonocetus. So this one, and in the use is this one. So this is Remingtonocetus, and again, quite fascinatingly, this one is a bit more derived than Indoeus. It was fully aquatic already, uh, very similar to an otter, uh, to, to modern otter, but of course uh, related to whales in that particular case. And uh, Remingtonocetus, we know from the anatomy and from the, the chemicals that we could, could find in its bones, we know that it was already an aquatic animal capable of traveling quite far, actually. And we find relatives of Remingtonocetus all the way to Africa. They originated in India, and they actually were capable of swimming all the way to Africa. So they were good swimmers. And this is, uh, and this is probably the reason why Remingtonocetus olfactory bulbs are so reduced. It was already fully aquatic, so swimming underwater was no longer an option. So that's how far back we can trace the ability to communicate through uh, smell. Now another ability to communicate is through touching, so tactile communication. One of the challenges whales are facing in terms of tactile communication is they don't have hairs and they don't have whiskers. Whiskers are one of the main touch organ, tactile organs in mammals, and it was also in whales' ancestors. So, but they still use the sense of touch. As you can see, uh, dolphins like to rub each other. And if you look at a uh, humpback whale, all those knobs on its face, they contain tiny air follicles. So there are still whiskers <laughs> in those humpback whales. Uh, and uh, more fascinatingly, there's the Guyana dolphin and the Guyana dolphin also have tiny hairs on its face. I'm sorry, this is the best, best picture I could find. Yeah, it's even more ugly than on my laptop. <laughs> <laughs> but believe me, there's one here. <laughs> <laughs> so there are tiny hairs on the Guyana uh, dolphin's face. And these tiny hairs, we uh, were studied very intensely by, by a team uh, from North America and they discovered that they may be used for electroreception. <coughs> so electroreception is the ability to sense any any electric current in the water. That's what shark do, sharks do uh, with their uh, low energy ampullae in their snout. So this is a sense that we thought was not used by mammals in general, and now we are finding that actually dolphins may be able to do that. So it's a, it's a completely new sense of uh, actually whiskers being co-opted into a new sense of okay. which is quite fascinating. And now to trace the evolution of um, hairs through, through the dolphin evolution, I'm afraid the fossil record uh, is absolutely empty of evidence. We, we don't find evidence of hair, but we can study the genes of modern whales and modern dolphins, and using a method called the molecular clock, long story short, the more, you, the, the more a gene is evolved, and uh, the more you can count mutations. And those mutations do not happen randomly, they happen at a certain rate. And so you count how many mutations have happened, and you can date how long a gene has evolved. I'm, I'm trying to make it short and simple. Uh, I actually don't understand what I'm talking about. I'm improvising. I'm not a geneticist. Are there geneticists in the room? Please don't, don't shut at me. <laughs> so, so yeah, they, they can use that method called the molecular clock, and they actually follow the evolution of the, the hair genes. There are many genes that are involved into uh, the maintenance of a fur tent, 
And these genes uh, apparently disappeared around 45, 46 million years ago. And this is why you see on that, on that picture you have our Remington Ocetus here, our otter like uh, whale ancestor with still uh, bristling with whiskers. And here you have the Protocetidae that came just after Remington Ocetus, they are just a little more whale like than uh, Remington Ocetus. And these guys here are represented without any whiskers. So uh, here, apparently, most of the genes that that made up the fur and the whiskers were lost. But as I told you, they were not completely lost. Uh, but some modern whales and dolphins still have some whiskers, or leftover whiskers. Uh, and you can see protocetids uh, were kind of not otter-like, but in that case, more seal-like. <laughs> Seal, but with a tail that's already evolving into a fluke, and you know, the, the hands with the palms, etc. So, and the teeth are scary, also <laughs> very scary. Visual communication yeah. now. Uh, so it's extremely difficult to see underwater uh, after past a certain, a certain depth. There's no light going through in water. <coughs> So dolphins and whales basically lost uh, most of their ancestral ability to see. And they, they usually have tiny eyes and they are colorblind. They are absolutely colorblind. Uh, they have only one receptor. Like you, you know, we have three cones in our eyes to, to see the colors. We are three chromatic also. That's, an, uh, that's how we put it. So there are three types of cells in our eyes. Dolphins and whales only have one. So they, are, yeah, they, 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 they basically don't see colors. Which in any way it would be useless because they live in water. There's barely anything to see underwater. And that's why also the, the colors, the diversity of colors in whales and dolphins is not that great uh, compared to birds, for example, on land. It's because yeah, they don't see much color anyway. And same thing, that color blindness, we can't trace it directly, but when you look at the skull of, again, Remington Ocetus, you see the, this is the eye socket here, and you can see the eye socket is very, very, very small. So sight was probably not the main sense organ in Remington Ocetus. But that doesn't mean that whales are not using visual cues to communicate, they still do. It just has to be very big uh, and easily visible. So, for example, here you have Blanville's big whale. So the Blanville's big whale has those massive tusks on the side of its head. Uh, this is an X-ray image to show you the tusks through the through that that flesh. <laughs> so th these are used for communication. Males do have it, but females don't. So they, uh, the males are telling the females, hey, look at me, my tusks are bigger. <laughs> so is everything else. <laughs> and same thing for the narwhals. You know, the, the narwhals uh, have those gigantic tusks. Uh, these, are, these are not horns, but uh, these are tusks. It's, uh, it's actually an incisor that was changed. No, uh, that's an incisor, sorry, a canine that's, that was changed into a, a gigantic tusk. And uh, the males use them to fight, which is kind of tactile communication, but they, they also use them to show the females, hey, look at me. <laughs> and now when you look at fossils, you will find signs of those uh, communication cues in the fossil record. So here is, for example, a skull that I studied when I was a master student. So the, the brain case on that side is about that big, and then the snout is about that long. Uh, and it's not complete, you see, it's broken off, so it would have been even longer than that. So this is a, a very weird kind of dolphin we call, uh, we call Schizodelphys, and this is what it would have looked like. So these uh, Schizodelphys and, and his uh, kin lived mostly in the northern hemisphere some 20 million years ago. And uh, we don't exactly know what the, that snout, that gigantic <coughs> mostrum, was used for. 
We think it's for communication with females, just like with the Narvol's uh, tusks. Uh, there's also a fair chance that just like Narvol's, they were using them to hunt. You see how it knocked out that, that fish? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like a ninja. <laughs> So there's also a fair chance that they were using the, their snout the same way as narvals do for communication, for fighting, and to knock out fish. Maybe also to, to look in the mud, you know, to, to shake off the mud, to find some, some invertebrates and stuff like that. You know, food and sex. That's true. <laughs> uh, we are getting a bit closer now, seven, seven million years ago, and this is Odobeno setups. From South America, Odobeno means uh, walrus and setups mean whale. So it's the whale, wa the walrus whale. It's a lot of W's. For, for me, that's uh, difficult to pronounce. But uh, so Odobeno setups is called the walrus whale because of this gigantic tusk, just like the narwhal. So it's a close relative to narwhals. Narwhals, whale, walrus. That's <laughs> So that way, virus is a close relative of Lamor. <laughs> uh, except that unlike the narwhals, the tusk is naturally, it's not, a, it's not damaged or it's not uh, deformed or whatever. It's the natural shape of that animal. The tusk is deflected to the side. So it's a very non-symmetrical animal. There's the tusk on the one side and no tusk on the other side. And again, uh, on that picture, you can see it applies to males, but not to females. So that's why we know it's a communication thing. Like they are, again, communicating their, their fitness to, to the females. And they were also probably fighting. And what that, that picture suggests is they were also probably using it to look, skim through the, 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 the bottom of the ocean for food. It's quite a very strange and fascinating animal. And one last example of visual cues, like of weird visual cues that evolved in uh, dolphins' ancestors. This is a big whale, also from South America, and it's called Globicetus because of the globe that it has on its face. This is not a tumor. This is the actual shape of the skull. So here you have the, the blowhole would be there, that's the snout here, and here that massive piece of bone which is not hollow, you can see that's a section through the, through the snout, and this is pure bone, actually. It's made of pure, solid, massive bone. It's a very expensive organ to develop, and it was probably quite an inconvenience. And, once, uh, and just like for the, the peacock and its very long tail, why would you accept such an inconvenience <coughs> and to reproduce? That's always the answer. <laughs> So to find the mate. So Globicetus was studied quite, quite extensively, and they found that, once again, males have bigger balls than females, which is not unexpected. So yeah, the, 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 that globe is bigger in males than females. So once again, this is a communication organ. <coughs> But now, of course, when you think about whale communication, you think about whale sounds, so acoustic communication, the hearing. Uh, and that's why the, I, I'm going to be short on that because, of course, uh, I don't want to encroach too much on Lloyd's talk. But here, uh, things to note about acoustic communication, it's, come, it's laryngeal, which means it comes from the throat, unlike the clicks of dolphins, which come from their blowhole. So uh, they produce their very low frequency sound from their throat. Uh, they, uh, the low frequency gives the advantage that they can communicate very long distance because low frequency sound, low, low frequency waves uh, can propagate for very, very long distance in the sea. Uh, they can basically communicate between two oceans. So that's kind of impressive. Uh, and these are extremely complex songs. Uh, they, they are harmonics, so they are singing more than one line at, a, at the same time. Actually, yep. I can give you an example. And there are patterns. 
that repeat themselves and that they actually repeat each other. Which means there is a grammar. There is a grammar to the sound. It's not just random noise. So here you see the harmonics, you see there's a one, one key, two key, three keys on top of each other. And if you listen carefully, you can hear the high pitch sound on top of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm doing it, but with a French accent. <laughs> and here, yeah, you can see how complex the songs can be. <laughs> and of course, the, the, the masters of communication by song, sound are the, the dolphins and killer waves and their relatives. And mostly because they are social animals, highly social animals, uh, even more social than the, the baleen whales can be. And uh, we've known for a long time that these animals were talking to each other, especially because they have, uh, because they, they, they have strategy, they develop strategies to attack their prey. So for example, this is the, the washing, the wave washing strategy. They coordinate, or you see all three killer whales are coordinating their swim to create a wave that will wash out that poor seal out of its uh, not so safe spot. So you see that that is an obvious sign of communication and coordination. So even if we let, let's suppose that we did not know how they were talking to each other, but we know. But even if we did not know how they were talking to each other, it would be undeniable that they are talking to each other. But we know how they talk to each other. They use a variety of noises. So breach, of course, breaching is a communication feature, uh, as Lloyd already told us. Uh, tail slaps, bubbles, but, and of course, they, are, they, are, they use their voice. They have actually two voices. One, that's called the, 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 the whistles, so they, they whistle to each other, and one that's called the echolocation, so they, they create clicks, and they use the, these clicks to talk to each other, and they also use these clicks as a sonar. So it's double use for the clicks. So the clicks come from this region of the, the dolphin's anatomy, so it's basically the blowhole, and around the blue hole, you have a combination of organs called the monkey lips and the dorsal bursi. So these are the monkey lips and these are the dorsal bursi. And they, they just keep one bubble of air in their nose and they make it go up and down and up and down and up and down to make those monkey lips clap onto each other. And that's how they create their clicks. And these clicks are ultrasonic. And that's what they use to, to, as a sonar and to talk to each other. So these are high frequency sound, as opposed to the Balin waves. Uh, these are high frequency sound. And uh, the, biggest, the biggest organ, the biggest phonic organ in a, an animal of all time is the, 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 the star waves phonic organs, so the, the dorsal bursae and the monkey lips of sperm whale, addition to the what is called the melon, which is the amplifier. So this is the, the melon here. So that's one of the dorsal bursae, which is also known as the spermaceti. Spermaceti not because it's used for reproduction, not this time. Spermaceti because they, it's white and, and gluey. So the, the, the whalers called it the spermaceti, the, the sperm of the whale, hence the name sperm whale. <laughs> so the, the, the sperm whale have this dorsal bursae which is turned into the spermaceti, and they have the midon, which is the amplifier for the, for the sounds that they are producing. And this all together creates the biggest phonic organ in the animal kingdom. So that's, uh, that's quite... a. Uh, that's quite an amazing animal, and you see how the skull is completely deformed to accommodate that organ. This is a very important <laughs> organ for them, and it has dramatically changed the anatomy. Now, can you believe that this is a mammalian skull? Like it's related to your dog. 
Imagine this is this is absolutely crazy. And so, just for the fun, this is a killer whale from the past, nine million years ago. They were killer whales that, unlike modern killer whales, uh, had lots of very useful <laughs> And you can see the size of just the one tooth here, even compared to the modern killer whale right here. This is just absolutely massive. And for comparison here, I like this one. This is Tyrannosaurus rex, you know, the biggest predator that ever lived on land. Well, this is this whale. It's called Leviathan Melvillei. This is the, that sperm whale uh, to, to the scale. So th this animal would have swallowed a Tyrannosaurus rex in one punch like <laughs> And of course, it was a, a whale killer. It was, it was hunting, actively hunting on whales. And it's called, so it's called Viviatan Milvillei, so there's both a reference to the Bible and to uh, Melville, who's the author of Moby Dick. So there, there's a double reference in the name. So now we know that, so I've, I've shown you how those uh, dolphins and killer whales produce their, 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 their end sperm whales or so produce their sound, so there's the, the claps, there's the, the whistles, and there's the clicks. So the clicks in particular are used by killer whales. Uh, for example, when they are hunting for fish, we know that they don't behave exactly the same way as they are when they are hunting for seals. The, the fish are not smart enough to understand the clicks, but the seals are. And so when they hunt for seals, they stop clicking, they communicate with other ways. Uh, and, they, and to do that, they use many channels and harmonics. So you see the clicks, they, they can also produce bursts of clicks. And of course, there are the whistles that I talk about. So they have a variety of communication organs, and they adapt them to their hunting strategy. So that's quite amazing. And also, the, the killer whales have dialects. So just like me, they have accents. So one family of killer whales doesn't have the same accent as the next family of killer whales. Uh, and these dialects are culturally transmitted. It's not, they are not born with it. They acquire the dialect. And if you take a killer whale and you take it to another place, which unfortunately we have done with uh, Sea World and things like that, well, they, they, they've seen that the, they, they actually never learn the dialect of their parents and they learn the dialect of the, the new places they are going. And same thing for the dolphins. Dolphins also, in addition to all the clicks and everything, dolphins also use signature whistles. A signature whistle is basically a name. They call each other by their name. So each dolphin has a signature whistle. Well, at least for the Tursiops, which is the one on the picture. So bottlenose dolphins have, um, have signature whistles. They call each other by their name. They can imitate the name of their king, which means they can call each other by their name. And they remember them basically for their lifetime. So they're freakingly similar to what we do. <laughs> to the point it becomes scary. <laughs> when, when you consider that they are actually learning how to sink boats, yeah, they, they, they are about to take over, I think. <laughs> And now these are all, well, when you, I've shown you the dorsal bursae, monkey lips, how they produce a collocation, the throat, the, etc. All of these are soft tissue. All of these, none of these actually fossilizes. So how do we paleontologists manage to study that? We have to be a little bit inventive. Uh, we have to, to be a little bit, um, uh, a little bit, uh, uh, yeah, I forgot how I wanted to finish that sentence. <laughs> um, anyway, we use x-rays. <laughs> the answer is x-ray. So we take our fossil whales, we put them into a CAT scan, and out of that CAT scan, we can see, thanks to the x-ray, we can see the inside of the whale skull, and we can study the inner ear. So these on the left and on the right, these are the inner ear of dolphins, the dolphin family, and the baleen whale family, so the Odonton city and BC city. And we assume that what they could hear is also the sound that they could produce. Because there's no point producing a sound that you cannot hear. 
So if you can know from the inner ear what they could listen to, you can also infer what kind of sound they were producing. And it's very interesting because, the, as you can see, an odontocet, so a dolphin inner ear, is very flat and you can see very thick. Uh, and this, this is an adaptation to, um, to a high frequency hearing. And on the other hand, a misty seat, a baleen whale, has a whipped cream like cochlea. So the, the inner ear is adapted for hearing low frequencies. So the whipped cream shape is for low frequency hearing, and the flat shape is for high frequency hearing. And then you can follow that through the fossil record, and you can assign, you see, for, you can assign your fossil based on the, the shape of the cochlea of the inner ear. You can assign your fossil to either of the two groups, or sometimes to none of them, which means they were not specialized for any type of hearing. And what we find is that primitively they were not particularly specialized. And then uh, sometimes around 30 to, 30, uh, to 35 million years ago, about here, there was a deep division between the two groups. The odontocyte that became specialized into high frequency hearing with something like this guy, which is called Ecovenator. It lived 25 million years ago and its inner ear is flat. So adapted to high frequency hearing. So we know it was using a sonar for hunting and communication. And on the other hand, you have the whipped cream shape that evolved into the ancestor of Misty City. And this is quite fascinating because when you look at those guys, you would not think they are related to modern whales. Like they don't have balins, they have teeth, and they are fairly small. Well, it's a big skull, but compared to a blue whale, it's a very small skull. And still, you can see uh, that thing was related to modern baleen whales. It's one of the earliest baleen whales. It's 25 million years old, and it did not have baleen yet. It was uh, actually skimming through the water with its teeth. So just like uh, the crab seal, modern crab seals skim the water, they filter the, the plankton, out of the water with their teeth, and that's exactly what these guys were doing before the balins actually evolved. So we can trace the origin of acoustic communication in and uh, their different style of communication, so low frequency for the mysticity and high frequency for the dolphins, all the way back to about uh, 30 million years, 30 to 45 million years ago. So that's uh, that's, that's the, the, the fantastic history of communication in ways. So you can see it's not just hearing, it's also all sorts of different style, different type of communications that we can uh, just with a little bit of imagination uh, reconstruct in the ancestors of those animals. And you can you could see we could trace some of those features very far back in time. So the yep. Uh, yeah, and of course, uh, acoustic communication, understand where that acoustic communication came from and how it's going to probably evolve in the future is important for conservation. Like we had the example of people wanting to make explosions in the ocean uh, to, to look for petrol and stuff like, for oil and stuff like that. But of course, it's going to disturb some kinds of ways, but maybe not some others. So it's important to understand where those could What's, what kind of communication we are talking about for conservation. And finally, there are many mysteries still to solve about whale communication, not only how it evolved, but also what kind of communication we have today. Like I told you about mechano, uh, sorry, uh, electro reception and electro communication, communicating through electric pulses. Uh, but there's also another type of, of uh, communication that I didn't touch, like magneto reception, feeling by the magnetic field, is also something that maybe whales can do, and there has been some literature about that. So yeah, uh, there are still mysteries out there, lots of to be discovered. And uh, thank you, thank you very much. For <laughs>